Hello, I'm Derek Walker. I'm the pastor of the Oxford Bible Church. And this is the start of a new series on the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the twofold ministry, the spirit upon and the spirit within us. And we want to compare the Old Testament to the New Testament to start with. You see, the spirit of God was very much at work in the Old Testament, but his ministry in the New Testament is far greater because of the work of Christ that he accomplished on the cross. Now, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon certain people at certain times to empower them, to speak, to do, to see supernaturally, to know supernaturally. The Spirit came upon people to gift them, to empower them to minister, to empower judges and kings to rule, to empower prophets to see in the Spirit, to receive God's Word and to speak God's Word. He anointed priests with the Spirit upon to teach, to intercede, to perform in the temple. And so the Spirit upon that we see in the Old Testament as well is power to minister. Now, there are significant differences between the Spirit in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. First of all, in the Old Testament, the Spirit did not come upon all of God's people, but only on a few. But there was a promise that there was coming a day when God would put His Spirit upon all His people. Let's look at Numbers 11. It says, Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him, Moses, and took of the spirit that was upon him and placed the same upon the 70 elders. And it happened that when the spirit rested upon them, that they prophesied. Notice the spirit upon Moses. That was his anointing as a prophet. And now that spirit came upon the others and they prophesied. The spirit upon is an anointing, a gifting to minister, to speak for God. And then it says, but two men remained in the camp, Eldad and Medad, and the Spirit rested upon them also. This was something new for them. Until now, it was mostly just Moses. Now, they were among those listed, among the elders, but they had not gone out to the tabernacle, yet they prophesied in the camp. The anointing, the Spirit upon, is the unction to function. And a young man ran and told Moses and said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. So Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, one of his choice men, answered and said, Moses, my Lord, forbid them. Then Moses said to him, are you zealous for my sake? Said, are you worried for me that I've got some competition now? Oh, he says, and this reflected the heart of God, the desire of God. Oh, that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them all. This was Moses' prayer, that not just he and certain ones had the spirit upon them, but all of God's people would be a prophetic community, an anointed people, anointed with the power of the spirit to minister, to prophesy, to preach, to intercede, to fulfill the ministry of God. And that was Moses' prayer, and that would be fulfilled in the new covenant. We see this, not just a prayer for this, but a prophecy of this in Joel 2.28. He announces, it shall come to pass afterward, or in the last days, that I will, the days of the Messiah, we could say, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, That is all believers, your sons and daughters, and he gives different kinds of people now, male and female, your sons and daughters shall prophesy because the spirit has come upon them. Your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions for the young and the old as well. They shall see in the spirit, they shall get revelation supernaturally. On my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit on the, in those days. So whether they are people high up in society or, or lowly servants as it were, they, the spirit would be poured out upon all God's people. That wasn't true in the old covenant, but it, it was a prophetic anticipation that this would happen one day. And both the prayer of Moses and the prophecy of Joel was fulfilled by Christ when he was raised from the dead. And he poured out his spirit upon all flesh because he 
established the new covenant in his blood and through the merits of the new covenant, now the Holy Spirit upon all of God's people who accept that new covenant is there for them. That's exactly Peter, what he proclaimed on claimed as fulfilled on the day of Pentecost at the birth of the church. Christ having ascended on high and poured out his spirit upon all of us. The power of the spirit upon us now is available for all of God's people, unlike in the Old Testament. Let's see what Peter had to say about it. And he quotes this prophecy of Joel, of course, in Acts 2. This is what was spoken. And what was happening, of course, was that the 120 representing men, women, old, young, all kinds of people, they were all filled with the Spirit and they were all anointed with the Spirit upon them. And they were prophesying, speaking by inspiration, supernaturally in the Spirit. And Peter said it's not just for the 120, they are a symbol of what God wants to do for all. He wants to put his Spirit upon all. Hallelujah. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your young men see visions, your old men dream dreams. And on, and on my men servants and on my maidservants I will pour out my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. You see, the spirit upon, the power to minister is for all, whether old, young, male, female, Slave or free, rich or poor. And they were all represented here in the 120. The Spirit upon uh, empowers us to see supernaturally, to go beyond the natural, like seeing dreams and visions, uh, and being able to speak supernaturally, having gifts of the Spirit, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, to be able to speak in the power of the Holy Spirit, that is to prophesy. And then Peter explained how this outpouring of the Spirit upon all of God's people was made possible in verse 32. He says, this Jesus that you crucified, God has raised up from the dead of which we're all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God, having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. So this is something that was promised in the Old Testament, but is now being fulfilled. He has poured out this this promise, a gift of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God upon all of us, he has poured it out, which you now see and hear. The Spirit of, of a, upon has outward evidence. You can see, you can hear it. It results in speaking in tongues. It results in prophesying. It results in some kind of supernatural evidence. He has poured out this, which you now see and hear. After his death and resurrection and ascension, you see, Jesus received this promise of the Spirit from the Father as our representative. He's our covenant representative. In the, uh, no longer is Adam our representative, praise God, but now Christ. He is the firstborn from the dead. He represents us to God as, as, as the, the man, the head of the new creation. And on our behalf, he received the Holy Spirit and he gave the Holy Spirit to all of us. And so it's for all of us who are in Christ, in the covenant. He received the Spirit as our representative in the covenant. And so now the promise of the Spirit belongs to all of us if we're in Christ. Therefore, he was able to pour out his Spirit upon all those who are in him, as, pro as Joel prophesied. And notice this was something new. This was a fulfillment of a prophecy that had not been fulfilled before. It only came into being on the day of Pentecost because it's a new covenant blessing. And it was only made possible when Jesus shed his blood. Jesus had to die first and then rise from the dead as our representative man, the head of the new creation, our high priest, and, rep and receive that promise from God. And then he could give it to us. And that's why he said to all believers, born again believers, you also shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise, that is the promise of the Spirit, is to you and to your children. And I like that he said this, and to all, and to all who are far off. Only qualification is as many as the Lord our God shall call. 
I thank God it wasn't just for them there on the day of Pentecost. It's for all who are far off. Yes, we're far off in time, almost 2,000 years. Yes, we're far off in space, a few thousand miles from Jerusalem, in a far off island. But it's the promise is for us. He says, for all that the Lord our God shall call. That means all true believers in Christ who have responded to the call of the gospel, you see, and received Christ. In fact, Ecclesia, the name of the, well, the church, means the called out ones. And so if the Lord your God has called you to salvation and you've accepted that, you are part of the called out ones, you qualify and the gift of the Holy Spirit is for you. You shall receive the gift because the promise is for you, praise God. So the promise of the Spirit upon to empower us, we all have different ministries, but we all have the ministry of sharing the gospel and, and bringing the power of God. The Spirit of God upon is for all believers in Christ through the new covenant. Hallelujah. Now, that's the first difference between the old and the new. The certain ones had the Spirit upon them, and even then it wasn't necessarily permanent. And in the new covenant, uh, all God's people have the Spirit upon. But there's an even bigger difference between the old and the new covenant. The second difference of the ministry of the Spirit in the New Testament from the old is that they did not have the Spirit within them. That is, within their spirit, they didn't possess the Spirit in the way we do. They didn't have the Spirit within them as, the, as we do in the New Covenant. We now have something amazing. We have the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's a wonderful fact that I want to bring home to you today, that the Holy Spirit of God lives in you, and He lives in you forever. You have the permanent indwelling of the Spirit. They never had that in the Old Testament. He didn't live in them, and He, and he wasn't necessarily even permanently on their life. For example, in Psalm 51, 11, David prayed when he sinned, Take not your Holy Spirit from me. Now that is an Old Testament prayer, that God wouldn't take the Spirit away from him because he sinned. Now he knew that that could actually happen. He could lose the anointing of the Holy Spirit. How did he know that? Well, Saul, who was king before him, that's exactly what happened to Saul. God took that, the Spirit, the anointing, off Saul, and the anointing was put on David. But that isn't something that is applicable to the New Testament because God actually gives us the Holy Spirit, not just upon us, but within us, and he does it forever. And we have that in the New Covenant. He does not remove his Spirit from us once we're born again, even if we sin. Because Jesus said after his death that he would send the Spirit who will abide within us forever. Praise God. I'll show you that right now in John chapter 14, verse 16. Jesus said this, I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper. That's a name for the Holy Spirit. That he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and he will be in you. He told them two things. The Holy Spirit would be in them and he would abide in them forever. The permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's a new covenant blessing. And it's for us too. Praise God. And so he, notice he says that the Spirit, you know him because he's with you. How was he with them? Well, because the Holy Spirit was within Christ. Christ had the Holy Spirit within him. And so, and the Christ had the Holy Spirit upon him. From his birth, he had the Spirit within him. From his baptism, he had the Spirit upon him to minister supernaturally. And so they had, the disciples knew the Spirit because he was with, with him, with them, because he was within and upon Jesus. But now Jesus is saying that the Spirit now, just as the Spirit was within him, and upon him, so now the Spirit was within them, will be within them forever. Isn't that tremendous? And they even knew the Spirit of God upon them to minister, even while they walked with Jesus. He gave them his anointing, 
And so they had a temporary anointing with a spirit upon them to minister. But after his death and resurrection, they received a permanent spirit of God within them and upon them. Praise God through the new covenant. We are a spirit, you see. We have a soul and we live in a body. And our spirit was created by the breath of God. God breathed into Adam, the breath of life, the spirit of life. And so God gave us a spirit and God is spirit. He gave us a spirit so that we could contact him, so that we could receive from him, so that we could worship him, spirit to spirit. But when Adam sinned, he died spiritually. He was warned. If you eat, you, dying, you shall die. You will die spiritually. And since then, because of sin, man has been born spiritually dead. And that means that even the Old Testament saints, even like David and Abraham, they were not born again like we are. They didn't have a spirit that was reborn and that was alive to God, um, as we do in the New Covenant. And so they did not have the indwelling spirit. Because how can the Holy Spirit indwell a dead spirit? Romans calls that old man, calls it the old man, the dead spirit. We needed to be born again. We needed to become a new man in our spirit. They didn't have that in the Old Testament. Now, man was made to be a temple of the living God, but the fall of man made him unfit unable to carry and possess the indwelling spirit. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You see, every man needs two births. The first birth gives us entrance into this earth through the water of our mother's womb. This is our natural birth, being born of the flesh. The second birth gives us entrance into God's kingdom, into heaven, through the spirit this is our spiritual birth, being born of the Spirit. We must have a reborn spirit to go to heaven. Jesus explained that in the next verses. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you are born of water, that's the water of your mother's womb, a natural birth, and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And then he clarifies, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So the first birth of water is the flesh, the second birth of the Spirit is the birth, the new birth of the Spirit. Don't, be, don't marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. It's not enough to have a natural birth. We need a spiritual rebirth. And that's something that only the Holy Spirit can do. Everything produces after its own kind, you see. So what is born of the flesh is our flesh, our Adamic inheritance. But what is born of the Holy Spirit is a new spirit that can know God, that can worship God, that contain the life of God, that the Holy Spirit himself can live inside our spirit. And that's what the new covenant brings. Jesus confirmed then that this new birth is a supernatural act of God's spirit. Like the wind, the Holy Spirit's invisible, but en full of energy and can do powerful things. And the Holy Spirit blows into your spirit and regenerates it when you accept Christ. He says, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who's born of the Spirit. Wind and Spirit is the same word, pneuma. This was all revelation to Nicodemus because the new birth was not available before the cross. He said, to him, how can these things be? How can this happen? And in response, Jesus explained the basis for this miracle to happen. He said, as Moses lifted up the bronze serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up on the cross, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to die on the cross, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Notice he describes the new birth as receiving eternal life, the life of God into your spirit. And that's done by the Holy Spirit. When we put our faith in Jesus, when we believe on Jesus as the Son of God, when we see him lifted up on the cross and taking our sin, and the bronze serpent is a picture of our sin being put on Jesus on the cross and judged, bronzed is the picture of judgment. And when we see him take our sin on the cross, praise God, when we receive him, then the eternal life of God comes into our spirit and we're born again.
Hallelujah. But this, of course, was not possible until Jesus was put on the cross, lifted up, and the new birth was not available to Old Testament saints before the cross. Jesus described this again in Matthew 9. He said, neither do men put new wine in old wineskins, lest the wineskins break and the wine runs out and the wineskins perish. But they put new wine into new wineskins or renewed wineskins. And both are preserved. In those days, wine skin, old wineskin that was cracked would be renewed by rubbing it with oil. See, the wineskins represent our spirits. They're designed to contain and to pour out the wine of God's spirit. But man's spiritual death in Adam meant that we were cut off, our spirits were cut off from God's lubricating life. And as a result, uh, we became like old wineskins. We could not contain the Holy Spirit within us. And so without, with that old spirit, the Holy Spirit cannot be within us, within our spirits. What's the answer? The answer is the new birth, is like the old wineskin being renewed by rubbing it in oil. That's a picture of the Holy Spirit in the new birth. The Holy Spirit comes in and he rubs it. He transforms it into a beautiful new wine skin that can contain the new wine. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. But it was only done after the, in the new covenant. See, the old man can't contain the new wine. But through the new birth, our old man was crucified with Christ, and in its place we receive a new man, which is righteous and holy, is a new creation in Christ, praise God, and is able to contain the new life of God. So God, first of all, renews the old wineskin, and we're born again, and then he puts his new wine. He puts the Holy Spirit in our spirit. Praise God. Old Testament believers like Abraham were forgiven. They were justified on the basis of their faith, but they were not born again. They were not new creations in Christ. They were counted as righteous, but they were not the righteousness of God in Christ because the new birth is something that belongs to the new covenant. It's made possible by the death of Christ. In Adam, you see, we're all spiritually dead and we needed a change of position and we needed a resurrection of our spirits. Jesus came to make that possible through his death and resurrection. So when we put our trust in Christ, we are taken out of Adam, we're put into Christ, hallelujah, and our spirits are raised up with Christ to new life. We were born again through our identification with Christ in his death and resurrection. And so our newborn spirit contains the resurrection life of Jesus. So it was only possible after the resurrection. And that resurrection life of Jesus has already overcome sin, Satan, and death. It is victorious. Colossians says, you were raised with Christ through faith in the working of God. That's what happened in your spirit, who raised him from the dead. And you, being spiritually dead in your trespasses, he has made you spiritually alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. You see, you receive your resurrection life into your spirits. It's applied by the Holy Spirit. And you are raised from death to life. This is the new birth. Ephesians says it. Even when you were spiritually dead in trespasses, he made us, our spirits, alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. You've been born again. And he raised us in our spirit up together with Christ. For by grace, you are saved through faith. And that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, lest any man should boast. So the, the new birth is an act of God's free grace through our faith. He did it in us. Praise God when we receive Christ. Our spirits were made new together with Christ, through our union with Christ. And as a result of the new birth, we are now God's workmanship, his new creation. Ephesians goes on to say, we are now his workmanship, his poema, his masterpiece, created by the new birth in Christ Jesus for good works. The Corinthians says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, in union with Christ, in union with his death and resurrection, he is a new creation in his spirit. Old things are passed away. The old spirit has passed away. Behold, all things now in his spirit has become new. Now all things, all things in his spirit are of God. That's a new man. He then says, what made this possible? He, God, made him Jesus to be, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 
He became sin so we could become his righteousness. And the amazing truth is that what we have in the new birth, which is a new spirit, and then the Holy Spirit living inside us, is greater than anything the Old Testament saints had. And that's confirmed by Jesus. You know, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there isn't anyone greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. See, John the Baptist had the Spirit of God upon him to fulfill a greater ministry than any man before him, but it was still under the old covenant. So even the least of us, even the person who's just been born again this second, has something even greater than the greatest of the Old Testament prophets. Because as new covenant, born again believers, we have a new spirit and we have the Holy Spirit living in us. Praise God. That also explains why when believers died in the Old Covenant before the cross, they went to Hades. They went down to paradise under the earth. But in the new covenant, after the resurrection now, believers go straight to paradise in heaven. Although they were forgiven, they were not born again. And they couldn't enter heaven yet, as John, as he says. You can't enter the kingdom unless you're born again. When Christ rose from the dead, he preached to all believers in paradise. It says, he preached the gospel to those who were dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. He preached he was the Messiah, the Son of God, risen from the dead. He died for their sins. And then they accepted him there, and they were born again. They received God's life in their spirit, and then Jesus took them to heaven in his resurrection. He led captivity captive, and that's why they're in heaven now. As it says in Hebrews, you've come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, registered in heaven, that's born again in heaven, that's us, to God the judge of all, and to spirits of just men made perfect. That's the Old Testament saints. They're in heaven now. They were counted as righteous, but they didn't go straight to heaven because their spirits were not made perfect until the resurrection. God made them perfect, and then he took them to heaven. And so they're listed separately from the church saints who were born, as it were, in heaven.